I'm going to start off with this. It's going to be awkward, but I'm sure there's some girls that will agree with me, and I just need to get it off my chest. Aaron Keyes is a good-looking dude. He's a good-looking dude. And uh, I'm okay and comfortable in saying that, okay? But, but in all seriousness, what I do want you guys to do is I want you to put your hands together and thank Aaron and his band for the way they have led you. <laughs> They, uh, they've done a great job. I was here last night, and as I've talked to our students from our church and just interacted, uh, they do a great job. And so you guys should be uh, super thankful that you're blessed by such, such great music leaders and talent as you've been here this week. My plan is to try to take you from this idea of unseen to the seen. And I have been giving a topic that on the surface uh, isn't something that probably gets a lot of us excited the way it should be. But it is something that, that I get excited about and something that I believe that when you hear about and think about and begin to really focus on, you will get excited with me as we think about this idea of ministering to those people who are indeed the people that no one thinks about. The poor, the lost, the oppressed, the needy, the ones that everyone overlooks. How do we suddenly get a vehicle to get on and move from thinking about the unseen to actually reaching the unseen? And to get into that topic, I'm going to show you just a quick 30 second clip from something from my family. I have two children. I have a six year old and a four year old, a six year old boy named Caden and a four year old a little girl named Kaya. And I want you to turn your attention to the screens. And if you feel led to sing along with what they're singing with, feel free to chime in, but just take a look at this. The Muneer children do not get their vocal chops from me, they get them from their mother. And uh, in all seriousness, this is why I wanted to show you that. My kids are doing that in the car on that day because they've seen their dad do that a thousand times. I'm not afraid to say it. I sing really loud to Adele in the car. I sing really loud to anything in the car. And my children are doing what they're doing in that moment because that's what they've seen their parents do. That's what they've seen me do. That's what they've seen my wife Kelly do. And here's the thing. When you love your parents, when you're connected to your parents, you want to be like them. You want to do what they do. You want to talk like they talk. You want to engage the way that they engage because the reality of life is when you know and care about your parents, you want to be like them. And I want you to put that thought in your mind and think about Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus was the fullness of God in flesh. It says that if you seen Jesus, you had seen the Father, and over and over and over in Jesus' life, he said this, I have come to do the will of my dad. If you want to know what I'm about, I'm about daddy's work. If you want to know what I'm here to do on earth, it's to fulfill the mission of my dad. And this is a core value that I want to build on with you this morning, and it's this truth, and you'll see some things on the screens just to kind of help you follow along today, and here's this core truth that I want to connect and build around, and it's this, that God's kids, they want want to be like their heavenly father, that God's kids want to be like their heavenly father, that if you are here today and you are indeed a Christ follower, you are indeed in love with Jesus and you want to be like Jesus, I want you to hear what John said about Jesus in 1 John chapter 2 verse 6. He says, whoever claims to be in him must walk as Jesus did. Whoever claims to be in Jesus must walk as Jesus did. And so here's the deal, friends. If you claim to be in Christ and, the, and God is your heavenly father and you are going to be like Jesus, you must walk as he did. You must take who he is and download it into your life and it must become reality. And what I want to do for the rest of our time is I want to take something about the life of Jesus where he was all about being like Jesus his dad and caring for what his dad cared about because God's kids want to be like their father and I want to develop that. Now some of you or most of you probably don't know a guy named Ron Wayne, but you should know his story or you would have known his story. In 1976, before most of your time or all of your time as students, there was this company that started that you know as Apple. 
and they make things like this. They make the phones that most of you probably have and enjoy. In 1976, three guys, two guys named Steve and this guy named Ron, formed the Apple Corporation April 1st. And, and as they started, Ron was at a place in his life where he had 10% of the Apple company. He started off and he was going to move forward. He was actually the designer of the first logo for Apple. He actually wrote the first Apple manual. And as he began to invest or to go forward with Apple, he got to a point where he realized, I've got some other financial debts and issues in my life. I'm not going to be sure if I can move forward. So less than two weeks into the beginning of him starting with Apple, Ron Wayne said, you know what, I'm going to get out. I'm not going to move forward. So he decided he was going to step away from Apple, and he sold his 10% back to the Steves for $800. He sold his 10% back for $800, and a few months later, he received another check for $1,500 in association with his work with Apple. In 2011, they estimated that his 10% in Apple would have been worth $35 billion. He went from $2,300 that he took to $35 billion he could have had. Now, you don't have to be a genius to know that that guy probably wished he had some kind of crystal ball to know what to invest in. If he could have looked forward in time and said, is this a worthwhile use of my time? Is this a worthwhile use of my relationships? Is this a worthwhile use of my, my money and my talents and my endeavors? Should I keep going forward? What he would have known, what he would have found out was that that money he was struggling with at the time would have been covered and then some. Wouldn't it be nice for your life, for those of you who are 15, 16, 18, 19 years of age, that if you could look forward down the pages of history of your life and go, what should I invest in? What relationship should I give to? What, what should I commit my time and energy? What should I focus on? Where should I go with my life? Wouldn't it be nice if you had a crystal ball to know this is the th kind of thing you should or should not commit to? Friends, I'm going to do my best today to be that crystal ball for you. And here's what I'm going to say as I read God's Word and try and apply it to your life in my life. I'm going to do my best to say there is something that you should invest in with your life because it's worthy of your time, it's worthy of your relationships, it's worthy of your money, it's worthy of your energy, and it's the church. It's the church. It's the local church, it's God's people moving forward. See, the church can be this weird thing where we associate it simply as a building, or God's people coming together in a room like this for a conference, but the church is God's people on mission, moving forward to bring glory to God while enjoying God, and as they do it, the launching pad for that is the local church. I said earlier that God's kids want to be like their heavenly father, and if you don't remember anything else that I say to you today, this is what I want to drive home to you this morning. If you are going to be like your father, if you're going to be like your savior, if you're going to commune with the Holy Spirit, here's the thing that you need to take home with you from this week, from this talk. You need to imitate your father by investing in the church. You need to imitate your father by investing in the church. If you've got a Bible, if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to take just a few moments and look at what Paul says about how Jesus felt about the church and how God the Father felt about the church and how we should understand why it is important that we invest in the church. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to pick it up in verse 25. Remember, we're trying to be like our Heavenly Father because God's kids walk as He did and we're going to imitate our Father by investing in the church. Ephesians 5 verse 25 says this, it's in the context of husbands, he's talking to how they should love their wives. Husbands, love your wives. How is it that I should love my wife Kelly? Just as Christ loved the church, notice that Christ loved the church, and how did he show he loved the church? That he gave up himself for her to make her holy and cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present to him present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. Guys, what this is telling us is that Jesus is nuts about the church. He's passionately in love with 
the church. He went so far that he would die, that he would give his whole life, that he would ransom her back, that he would buy her back, that he would engage the local church completely. Friends, if you don't believe that the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved in loving the church, you need to understand that the Bible says that Jesus got dirty, left heaven, came to earth, that when the church was launched, God launched the Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Spirit to us. He put down words for the Bible so we would know how to live and carry out life in the church. And ultimately, hear me when I tell you this, the value of an object is determined by the price that is paid for that object. And the church was purchased on Calvary by Jesus. And if you want to imitate your father, you're going to invest in the church. Look, I get it. I get it. Because some of you have checked out already and you're like, dude, you're a stranger to me. You don't know my church. Like, I can't get away from my local church fast enough. Keith, if you knew my church situation, if you knew where we came from this week, you would never tell me to go back and invest in my church. It's a waste of time. It's not moving forward. And what I want to say to you is, if you don't like what God is doing in your church, then you go back and be a part of the solution. You go back and move forward in a way that would, that would say, God, I want to bring you glory. I want to imitate my father. I want to be like you. I'm going to invest in the church. And you go back. You have a teachable spirit. You have a humble heart. But you go to leadership in your church and you say, this is how we chase after the unseen together. This is how we move forward. This is how we give our lives to something that is worthwhile. The text says that Jesus gave up his life and continues to wash the church and is involved in the church. And so hear me when I tell you this today. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the story of your life should have the work of the church at the center of it. If you are a believer, make sure that the work of the church is central to your story. Now, please hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying all of your life should be involved in the walls of the church. I'm not saying that at all. Jesus came to seek and rescue those who are lost, the sick need help. So do not think that I'm saying to you, all of your life should be consumed by things in a church building. That's not my heart at all. We need to be a sent people, as we heard last night, the gospel at its very essence is a go gospel, it's a sent gospel, it's a missional gospel. But if you are a believer, the totality of your life as you move forward should have church as a central part of it. You should be connected to God's bride. He calls it his bride because he's in love with it and he wants to move it forward in a way that will reach the world. Listen, if you want to make a difference with the unseen, you want to reach the poor, you want to reach those who no one else is caring about, the vehicle to do that is the local church. The local church will partner you with organizations that are doing that. It will help give you resources. It will train you. It will disciple you. It will move you forward. Now, I could come up here and I could say this. You should be involved with the local church because God said so, and I could sit down and we'd be done. But I don't want to do that. I want to give you a few reasons in my mind that Scripture lays out that you need to imitate your father and invest in a local church. And I want to give you those reasons as they come from Scripture and as you begin to think about why or why not emotionally you should be invested in the church. Here's the first reason that I want to give you that you should commit to the church this morning. And this is huge. The first thing is this. The church is bigger than a fad. It's bigger than a fad. So many of us in this room invest our time and energy into things that won't matter in five hours. They won't matter in five days. They certainly won't matter in five years. And for most of us, what we're focusing on won't matter in 50 years. It's interesting how we give and give and give and give and give to things that are popular for a season and then go away. When I was in junior high, I was in eighth grade. And uh, in eighth grade, this style got popular that was jean overalls with what was called an IOU shirt underneath it. Now, some of the youth workers in here will remember that. They normally were black or red or purple, these IOU shirts. And then you would have these overalls that were actually shorts, and you would wear them. And then the, the thing that was ridiculous is you would wear one strap down. 
So I would walk around Norton Middle School and I would look like a complete idiot. I looked like a white extra in a bad hip hop video. It was insane. I mean, it was so, so bad what I looked like. And yet, I invested my time, my money, my energy, my thoughts, my emotions, my care into that stupid red IOU shirt, those stupid overalls, and I walked around because I thought that would make me somebody and people would see, and that had my attention, and that had my focus, and then before you knew it, it was gone and irrelevant, and all I had was something taking up space in my closet. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 17. He's with his, his key leaders. They're at Caesarea Philippi. He comes to them and he says, who do they say that I am out there? Well, some say you're Elijah and some say you're this guy. And he stops them and he says, but who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up and he says, you're Jesus. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Then the next verses launch the church as Jesus says this, Blessed are you for saying this, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He says, I will build my church, and it won't be a seasonal thing, it won't be something that's just in style for a little bit, it won't be something that's kind of relevant, it will be an eternal thing that will go on forever and ever and ever, and I will build it. And I want to say to you today, don't you want to be a part of something that will last? Don't you want to be a part of something that you can look at and go, this is meaningful, This is something that that matters to my kids and my kids' kids and my neighbors and my friends and to the world. Something that you can look at and it's not like skinny jeans or it's not like Tom's shoes or it's not like the next release of Call of Duty or it's not like your favorite team winning the championship. It's not something that's going to pass. It's eternal. It's not a fad. And you sit here and I sit here and we say, what's a good investment of my time? What's a good investment of my energy? I would submit to you today that Jesus says, I will build my church and it will not fail. Invest in that. Invest in that because it isn't going somewhere and it's not going to go away. And you're not going to be watching a a, a VH1 I Love 2012 and they're going to go, hey, that was the year that Bieber was big and then that was the year that The Dark Knight came out. And then that was the year that that, that somebody won a championship and the church was kind of relevant then. The church will always be relevant because it's not a fad. And so many of us in this room, we give our attentions and our energies and our focus to things that are going to evaporate and mean nothing. I want to just say to you, imitate your father, invest in the church because it's bigger than a fad. It's something that will last, something that will be meaningful, it's something worth giving your life to. The second thing I want to say to you about why you should invest in the church is this. You should invest in the church because the church has the remedy that we all need. The church has the remedy that we all need. You don't have to live very long to figure out that the world is broken. In fact, if you flipped on the news this morning, those of us who had access to it, Last night at a midnight showing in Colorado, an individual walked into a movie theater and shot 50 people. 12 of them died. 38 injured. You don't have to pay much attention to the news or Google something or be on Yahoo to say that people are broken, that things are dysfunctional, that marriages are crumbling, that your friendships are off, that that people are lost and confused and people are desperate for hope and they don't even know they're desperate for hope and they don't know they're desperate for hope because they're propping up their life against all kinds of gods that will never sustain sex drugs money achievement sports family all the idols you can list we're propping our life up against those And God would come to us and he would say, the world doesn't need makeup. They need a cure. They need to be solved. They need to be, they need to experience what I really created them for. I was visiting a woman in the hospital probably three years ago now who had terminal cancer. She was, she was dying and she was in a tremendous amount of pain. And when I would be with her, I could see her pain level getting higher and higher and higher. And she was only able to push the button 
at the hospital to get so much medicine at a time. And you could see her pain level increasing and increasing, and then she would get the signal and she was allowed to hit the button to get more medicine. And she would hit that button and the medicine would flood her veins and you could just see the relief in her being. The part that broke my heart was when I would stay a little bit longer, it would wear off. And she would need more of just that medicine to solve her situation. Friends, we live in a world where people are temporarily numbing their pain. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that salvation comes by no other name under heaven. If you want a remedy that will solve people, that will come and get people fixed to the way it was, because things are broken, things are off, people need hope, yes, in the form of temporary things. We absolutely should be giving them backpacks. We absolutely should be feeding them. We absolutely should be giving them clothes. But friends, people need Jesus, and the church is the vehicle to reach people for Jesus. We need to give them the remedy that will deal with all of eternity. And you and I, as people, who are part of the church, we get to do that all the time. I dare you to tell me that you will invest in the church, reach someone for eternity, and then tell me it's a waste of time. I dare you. I dare you to give your life to the church, invest in life change, invest in transformation, and to see what God is doing as he allows you to be the vehicle of remedy to people as you bring them Jesus, as you bring them water, as you reach the unseen, and then tell me it wasn't worth the investment. See, we should be involved in the church. We should imitate our Father and invest in the church because it's bigger than a fad. And it's also the hope that people need. Guys, I believe passionately that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And the vehicle to extending that hope is his people, the church. And the local church extends that. And I'm saddened that so many of us, we kind of sort of date our church. We're kind of loosely involved and connected to it. Here's the third reason that I want to give you why I want you to invest in your church and be like your heavenly father. And I hope you hear this this morning because this is so important. The church has a U-shaped hole waiting to be filled. The church has a U-shaped hole waiting to be filled. Not only do I want to be a part of something that lasts and a part of something that actually makes a difference and helps people. I want to be a part of something that I fit in. I want to be a part of something that I, I can look around and go, yeah, I was designed to be a part of this. I want you to flip back in your Bible from Ephesians to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to show you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 something that is just, it's just heartwarming to know as a believer that the God of the universe personally directed you to be a part of something. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 7 and then we're going to skip to verse 14. Verse 7 says this, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That says that every single believer in Jesus Christ is gifted by the Holy Spirit for the good of the church. There are no exceptions to this clause. Every one of us in here who is, has a relationship with Jesus, who's a part of God's family, has been gifted by the Holy Spirit for the good of all of the body. Then look at what he says at verse 14. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would for, not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Listen to me, listen to me, please. No one in this room is designed and put where they are by accident. You might have been a surprise to your parents 
but you were never a surprise to the God of the universe. There was never a point where God the Father looked over at the Spirit and He was like, where'd that Susie Smith come from? Anybody know anything about Susie? Like, that never happened. God was like, bam, I knit you together in your mother's womb intentionally, placed you right where I wanted you. Your family situation, your gifts, your talents, even the ugliness of your past, God has brought that together and will work that for good if you will allow him to put you in a church and be used. And hear me when I tell you this, there is no one in your church that can do what you can do because there's only one of you. There's nobody. You are the only one who can do in your church what you can do. Because God says some people are eyes and some people are the liver and some people are the nose and some people are the ears. But whatever you are, you need to plug in. And if you're sitting on the sidelines at your church and you're not investing, you are missing the fact that God has uniquely designed you. Your talents, your passions, your experience, those are all on purpose. So hear me, come on, ready? If you're creative, like you're an artist, Get involved in a creative way at your church. If, if you're someone who's good with people, figure out a way to greet people and talk. And just because you're a student doesn't mean you can't call first-time guests. You're, you say, Keith, well, I'm not, I'm not good with necessarily people and I'm not, I'm not an artist. Are you an organizer? Are you someone with a vision for people who are on the outside? Are you someone who's passionate about a certain area that needs to be solved in your city? Are you generous? All of these things are things that maybe uniquely you have been designed for and your church is missing that because you're not involved in owning that. And the Bible says you were given a gift, you were plugged into God's body for a specific purpose. So quit sitting on the sideline. Guys, when I, when I got to the church that I'm at, I was 25 years old. It was a church that at the time had roughly 50 people and was dying. And, I, and I, don't, I don't say this to boast, but this is what I tell you. The reason I could go to a church at 25 and I could see what God was going to do at our church and move forward is because when I was 16, I was actively serving and loving and involved in my church. When I was 16, I was at a church that for all practical purposes didn't really preach the Bible. I didn't become a Christian in that church. And I was leading a Bible study in that church that was the largest Bible study in the church for adults and students alike. The pastor of our church at the time gave a message where he did not really preach the gospel. In fact, he taught something completely against the gospel. And I approached him and said, where is that in scripture? He said, nowhere. He said, it's not there. We had a long conversation about his view on the Bible. It didn't line up with what our God would teach. And I went home to my parents as a 16-year-old, and I said, I'm not going back to that church because I need to be in a church that is preaching the Bible, reaching people for Jesus, and a church that I can feel good about plugging in to move forward. Here, here's what I'm driving at. You can make a difference as a 14-year-old. You love kids? Get involved in your children's ministry. You love to cook? Get involved in your food ministry. You love to sing? You love to play music? Get involved in your music ministry. There is not an excuse for one person in this room to not be involved in the local church in some capacity because the God of the universe ordained and created you to do it. Imagine you went to someone's house and they prepared an unbelievable meal for you. They prepared steak and unbelievable vegetables. I like steak because anyone in this room who's a vegetarian has lost their mind. Am I right? Yeah. My favorite restaurants are restaurants that just serve meat, right? Like, so imagine you went to someone's house and it's the best meat or for you vegetarians, the best asparagus you could ever have prepared and it sat in front of you and they worked hard and they prepared it and they set it down and you picked up your fork and then you didn't eat. It would be an insult to the preparer, the one who made it, and it would also be an experience that you would miss out on. 
And every one of you who has been ordained and crafted and gifted by God, who is not plugging into the church, is looking at your heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, and saying, I know you intentionally designed me to be here, but no thanks. And you are insulting the preparer, the creator, you're insulting the Holy Spirit, and you're coming to a place where you are missing out on the experience. Every one of us needs to take our opportunity to be involved in a local church very seriously because we are to imitate our Father and invest what He invests in. I want to give you kind of two where do you go thoughts from this, okay? Two where do you go thoughts from this. The first one is of, of utmost priority for everyone in the room. The first is you cannot imitate your father if he's not your father. So number one, maybe today you need to join the family. And join the family, I don't mean join the church, I don't mean participate in more conferences. What I mean is this, if you are here and you have been at this conference and you have been hearing the gospel preached and you have been hearing this reality that you are a sinner in need of Jesus. I, it was so clearly articulated last night. You are on the side of God's wrath and you need to be pulled out from under that by the grace of God, by Jesus. And if you are here, you cannot imitate a father that you do not know. And so if you're not a believer, come on, quit playing games with this. You have a faith system you are leaning into. Every single person in this room today is a believer in some type of faith system. The big questions in life, how did we get here? Where do we go when we die? What is right and wrong? What is it the meaning of life is? All of the answers to those questions for everyone is by faith. Quit pretending you're smarter than everyone, you're not living by faith. Everyone is living by faith. And Jesus comes to you and he says, listen, faith is only as good as the object that it's in. And you need to lean into me. And so for some of you, the thing that you need to do today is you need to join the family. You can't even care about the church until you know Jesus. And the moment Jesus begins to, to, to do a, a makeover in your life and get a hold of you and change you and transform you is the moment you go, I want to be a part of his family. I want to own his family. I want to be missional in his family. I want to go forward as one of his kids. So here's the deal. For some of you, you need to join the family. You need to say, I get it. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. And I want to follow him. But for, for the majority of us, we know Jesus, we follow Jesus, we're trying to imitate our Father. Here, here's, here's what I want to say to you today. Wherever you're at with your local church, I want you to up your investment. I want you to up your investment. If you're going to imitate your Father and you're going to invest in the church and He's going to build this thing that the gates of Hades will not prevail against and He's going to move forward and He has given Himself up and He is cleansing her and He is moving her forward, I want you to up your investment. So, so what do I mean by that? Maybe, maybe you're a person who goes to your youth group, but you don't talk to anyone, you don't invest, you don't care, you don't reach out there. I want you to up your investment. I want you to move from being an attender at your youth stuff to someone who actually cares and is trying to make a difference. Maybe your youth ministry at your church has small groups and you have never gotten in a small group. I want you to say this will be the year that I want you to get in a small group. Maybe, maybe you should start financially giving. Yes, you as a teenager. My children every once in a while get money for doing things around the house and my son, particularly the six-year-old, when he does something, he has three envelopes in his room. The three envelopes have a 10, a 10, and an 80 on them. I hand my six-year-old his dollar and I say, buddy, here's the deal. 10 cents goes to church, 10 cents goes to money that you're gonna save to buy what you want. 80 cents, you can do what you're just going to do it. Some of you have jobs and you spend all of your disposable income, if you're honest, on yourself. You don't invest in what God is sowing into you at your church and you need to up your investment. Start giving now. Some of you need to in, up your investment by serving, by owning your church, by taking 1 Corinthians 12 to heart and saying, I'm going to get involved, I'm going to serve, I'm going to move forward in that way, I'm going to get involved in kids ministry, I'm going to get involved in music ministry, I'm going to own my 
church. Some of you need to up your investment that way. Some of you need to up your investment by reaching out to people, just caring for people. But here's the deal, I want you to up your investment. I wanna to talk to a specific group of students right now that are here. And that's the group of students who are here who have graduated high school and are getting ready to move on to college. Listen, you're gonna be out of your parents' home, most of you, and you are moving forward to where you have to put on your big boy, big girl pants, and you have to invest on your own. And I wanna just say something to you that I think is so important. You go away to school, I cannot strongly suggest this enough. As soon as you can, find a church. Find a church. And you get there and you begin to invest and you begin to train and you begin to disciple and you begin to get discipled, go find a church. Some of you are going to be playing in a world you know nothing about with people that are going to be more broken and more lost than you can imagine. You need to get in a church. You need to own that. I want you to move forward and say, today I'm going to take a bold step and I'm going to up my investment. Listen, if you want to follow, follow your heavenly father, you're going to invest in what he invests in. Our father loves forgiveness. He loves mercy. He loves justice. He loves seeing people cared for, but our Father loves the church. I want you to do me a favor, and I just want you to bow your heads right now. I want every person in this room right now to just bow their head. And I want to give you just a couple thoughts, and uh, then in a moment the, the band will come forward and they'll lead us, but I just want to give you a couple thoughts. The first is to the group of you who are here where you're just like, you're not in. You don't get it, but may hear me, hear me clearly. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth. He died for you. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. And my plea to you today is that you would join the family. That you would quit messing around, that you would quit playing games, that you would say, today is the day I am born again. I want to follow Jesus. I repent of my sins. I turn and I get on board with what you've done. And today would be the day that you would join his family and you would adopt your heavenly, your, allow your heavenly father to adopt you. And if that's you, from your heart to God's being, just communicate that you want you want that. You want to repent. You want to follow him. You want to be a part of God's family. You want to be a part of something that isn't a fad, something that brings great remedy to hurting people, something that you were designed for. To the second group of us, would you just ponder, like, are you, are you in with your local church? Not like you go there each weekend. But like you're in, you want to make a difference through your church. You, you care about it like when your church succeeds, you're happy when your church is struggling, it hurts you because you love your church and you're imitating your father and you're investing. Like, and then here's the question, what's keeping you from doing that? And what I want to say to you today is wherever you're at, if you're a believer, man, up your investment in the church. And during this moment, I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit to say, how could I up my investment? And I just want you to let the Holy Spirit communicate to you what that might need to be. And as you feel God's impression upon you and how you can up your investment, I want you to have the courage to tell someone with your group here this week, and this is what I'm gonna do to up my investment at my church. Guys, God's plan is Jesus, and Jesus' ambassadors are us. We are the ones who get to share with the world the good news. And the vehicle to do that is our local churches. Let's pray together. God, I pray for this conference. 
I pray that as people walk away from this week, there would be really profound differences, not only personally, but in our local communities. God, there is the potential in this room to change schools and to change cities and to change families and to change areas of the world for you if we will surrender and we will get involved in your design, in your plan, and we will do what we were created to do. God, I pray that there are people that are here today that would say, today's the day I'm going to up my investment, I'm going to move forward in a passionate way with my church, and I'm going to imitate my father, and I'm going to love what he loves, his bride, the church. And God, I pray that there would just be tons and tons of churches that are made different as a result of this moment. God, continue to speak to these students and allow them to sense your love, your real care, and what you want to do with their lives. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.